as well. So, so pleased to hear your presentation today. Wonderful. And I understand you've got a, a big event in Colorado. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, October 3rd and 4th, the Global Blockchain Summit. And um, <clears throat> yes, and I look forward to seeing you at um, Converge to Accelerate. I will, uh, I will be in Boston. Yes, awesome. Excellent. Well, we're just at the top of the hour, uh, so we'll get started, and I suspect we'll have people uh, joining the call momentarily. Um, but uh, first of all, I, I'm assuming everyone can see the screen that's shared with our agenda for the day. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it looks great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so as always, we, uh, we record these events, and, uh, and so please keep that in mind as we move forward. Uh, as well, uh, we always want to be sensitive to uh, the antitrust policies of the Linux Foundation, and so I'll show you our slide here. Uh, please feel free to read through that, uh, and there are details in, in the, the, the URL within the, uh, the notice itself. Uh, but in general, it means just be a good person, uh, and so feel free to read that uh, in, a, in any more detail that you need to. Uh, and with that said, um, I'm just looking through the, the list and I don't see any new names particularly, although we have someone that I think that might be reasonably new, uh, Septarshi. Um, did you want to introduce yourself? I think you were on uh, one of the earlier calls uh, with uh, uh, Stephen's uh, interoperability uh, subgroup. Yes, exactly. So, hi everyone. Uh, Septarshi Chaudhary here from Paramount Software Solutions. and. Uh, I primarily take care of the blockchain initiative of Paramount, and we're mostly into the uh, consulting arena. Right? Excellent. Uh, and and tell me a little bit about the organization that that you work with, Paramount. Oh yeah. So we started our blockchain initiative last year in April, end of April, by partnering with uh, Hyperledger. We are a general member of the Hyperledger and. Uh, I do actively take part in some of the SIGs, like the public sector SIG and uh, the learning materials uh, working group with Bobby and uh, the DCI with Dan and David. And uh, we just had one uh, presentation last month in Japan, which I attended, and I'm based out of uh, Bangalore in India. Bangalore, sir. Excellent. And then uh, t are you using uh, any of the Hyperledger frameworks, uh, Fabric or? Yes. Oh, okay. Fabric. It's Fabric. We are doing some of the projects in Fabric. Oh, excellent. Very good. And, and uh, without uh, getting too deep into the IP, uh, can you share a little bit about what you're using Fabric for? Uh, well, uh, I can just say the specific operations or the projects that we are working, uh, they are mostly into the logistics and supply chain. And uh, right now, we're expecting to begin one project that's going to be into the health and wellness area, but not specifically within the healthcare. Uh, we are also exploring the payments within the healthcare sector and the interoperability to be precise. And that's true for the Atlanta region of companies. Oh, outstanding. Very cool. Uh, and you mentioned that you're out of India. Is, is the organization located uh, as well uh, or represented in the United States anywhere? Yes. Our base location is in uh, Atlanta and uh, I'm working remotely from India. Ah, I understand. Oh, excellent. Oh, very good. Well, uh, as always, glad to have you. And I think we met uh, previously, but it's always uh, good to see uh, sort of a new face uh, joining the crew here. Uh, and again, uh, as always, welcome. Thank you. All righty. Uh, so uh, as people get on the call, uh, I'll, I'll walk us through a couple of com community announcements. I had uh, something just recently come up uh, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, which was that we do have the, uh, the next Hyperledger Global Forum coming up, and that's going to be in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, that's next year, early March uh, of next year. Um, and uh, so we're, we're looking really for uh, uh, the opportunity for folks uh, here within this uh, special interest group uh, to submit proposals for talks. Uh, and that uh, deadline for proposals is coming up next week, in fact, next week, Friday. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, please feel free to contact me and I'll put you in touch with uh, uh, David Boswell, who's my uh, uh, person uh, on the leadership side of the equation here. Um, and it'd be great to have you. I think what we're planning to do, at least at the moment, uh, is uh, we're going to be hosting a healthcare panel. Um, <clears throat> 
excuse me, we're going to be hosting a health healthcare panel, um, and that's going to be, I think, managed through one of my colleagues here in the Seattle area, uh, Marissa Ionaroni, uh, and I honestly don't know uh, how many folks she's got on the panel quite yet. Uh, however, if you plan on uh, attending the forum, let me know, and uh, we may want to, to maybe do separate panels or uh, a series of different panels uh, circ uh, circulating around the healthcare topic. Uh, so again, if you're interested, please let me know, and then, like I said, I'll, I'll find a way for us to, to, to coordinate that uh, offline. Uh, but it is a great opportunity, and then uh, it is kind of a nice, uh, well, I'll speak for myself, it's a nice opportunity for, for those of us in the Pacific Northwest to to go to Phoenix rather than all the way to the East Coast. It's, sometimes it's so very far away. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, this is an opportunity to participate in a, a global forum that is actually here in the US. Uh, and then I pro, uh, I've also provided the, the link uh, to details for the forum itself, um, and that is located here. So feel free to go there. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, for those of us that are newer to the organization, uh, we do have a membership directory that uh, if you haven't already, please feel free to fill this out. This is sort of uh, kind of a virtual calling card of sorts or a business card. Uh, it's just a great way for, for people to interact and connect with one another through the organization here. And so feel free, uh, if you have your Linux Foundation ID already set up, uh, you, are, uh, you, you have no, uh, there's, it's, you, you can do your own edits to this. Uh, there's a long way around to say that. Go ahead and, and edit the wiki page directly with your information here, and you can just follow the format as it's listed uh, on the sheet there. Okay, does anyone else have any, uh, any community announcements as it relates to healthcare uh, and hyperledger technologies in healthcare specifically? Um, this is Wendy. Uh, I, I just wanted to remind the group I had sent an announcement earlier this week about um, the request for proposals from the HIMSS 20 Blockchain Symposium. Um, if you're working on a project and you have, especially if you have some data that you'd like to share, some success stories you'd like to share, we would love to hear from you. We'd love for you to become a speaker at the um, symposium. So. Um, Please do, uh, I sent an email earlier. If you like, I can also ping the group in uh, the chat box right now so that uh, you're just aware of this opportunity to get your message out there and share your experiences with the larger blockchain community. Yeah, you know, Wendy, uh, maybe we can uh, send out to full membership uh, the same, that sort of reminder again, uh, just to, just just to remind folks and and the deadline is is it next week it's Friday? yeah september 30th oh september 30th okay yes did, did that change by the way that uh, did that deadline change no we were actually hoping for an extension because the um for most of the symposia for hymns 20 the deadline the submission dates are september 6th through september 30th except that the one for the blockchain symposium didn't go out until like the 12th so we were hoping that it could be the deadline could be pushed back but that's not the case so we're just really trying to get the word out uh, and encourage people to submit um, before september 30th Gotcha. And the, and the reason why I asked, I, I just received something from uh, Hyperledger Leadership, and they had asked me um, about some some sort of extension for uh, for a blockchain uh, group. I thought it was through HIMSS, and I thought it was something that you and, and David had been working, and uh, it just didn't seem clear to me that some dates had changed. And so um, I just was curious about that. We'll take this offline a little bit. Uh, just Yeah. To, and I, I will certainly, I can certainly confirm with Caroline Kennedy, who is organizing the symposium for HIMSS 20 and just verify the dates. And then I can send another, like a reminder announcement to the larger HIMSS uh, um, healthcare special interest group community. Okay. Somehow I am on the hook for a presentation uh, at HIMSS. I just don't know uh, where and in what context or even what forum. So yeah. I'm, just, well, I'm just trying to figure it out. <laughs> uh, sure. So there is a track, a blockchain track for the overall HIMSS 20 conference. And then there's a separate blockchain symposium that's a pre-conference activity. And I am talking about, yes, the pre-conference activity. Okay. Okay. Uh, perfect. Alrighty, well, thanks. Uh, appreciate the clarification and the notification, and then yeah, we could probably uh, ping membership again just to to remind those uh, those folks that that opportunity is out there. 
Okay, any other community announcements uh, before we get started? Alrighty, well, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have uh, uh, Susan uh, on the call uh, from uh, Spiritus. Uh, is, is Bob on the call as well, or is it just gonna be, is it gonna be you, Susan? It'll be just me right now. Ah, okay. Uh, and so I'm gonna make you host, uh, and so I'm gonna hand over to you, and um, feel free to take control of the, of the screen and, uh, and go ahead and set up for your presentation. Uh, and so just as, as Susan is getting set up, uh, again, we wanted to thank uh, both Susan and Bob for their participation. Uh, and we're gonna have, a, I think, a really good conversation about uh, really medical devices and, uh, and how uh, blockchain uh, as part of a, of a larger strategy is, is used for tracking uh, medical devices uh, through, their, uh, through their life cycle. Uh, and so I'm very excited to see uh, how this all comes together. Uh, and uh, we'll give Susan uh, about a half an hour or so, maybe a little bit more time to give her presentation and then we'll, uh, we'll get into discussion. Thank you. And can you see my screen at this point? Uh, no, it's just, okay, I, I still see, I still see me. Okay, let me go back. And if it's a real problem, I could I could display the PDF here, and I'll, you could just drive me through that. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, I think it still wanted me to confirm that I was taking it from you, uh, which is always good in a cockpit. Yeah, there you go. You're good to go. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you to those who've joined us and uh, those who may uh, catch the recording later. Uh, Bob Clint and I uh, founded Spiritus some three and a half years ago uh, with an eye to how we might uh, improve uh, medical device safety, quality, and compliance across the life cycle of medical devices. Um, we come from um, different backgrounds, uh, perhaps, than some. Uh, my business background uh, in financial services, extending back about a quarter century, uh, comprehensive to enterprise sales, product management, technology strategy, corporate development, and actually the last eight or nine years as head of uh, enterprise risk um, at a $9 billion financial services firm. So among other things, I, I had to deal uh, increasingly with personally identifiable information, cybersecurity risks, and operational infrastructure, and the like, um, as well as strategic risk introduced by uh, innovative emerging technologies uh, like artificial intelligence, and ultimately blockchain distributed ledger. Uh, Bob's background is uh, a data background, uh, a number of years with um, big four uh, IT consulting firms doing work for Fortune 50 companies and um, government agencies around their data and business intelligence needs. So as those tools have evolved over the years uh, uh, and the needs and awareness have evolved, Bob's been able to, to maintain that, uh, that focus. Um, we uh, began our journey by exploring uh, a hypothesis about uh, information we'd seen and certainly with the introduction of a lot of innovation in medical devices and, and the sheer growth based on uh, uh, greater affluence and, and demographic aging across, uh, across nations that uh, medical device safety and quality were uh, significant problems. And in fact, the, the evidence bears it out. Uh, the volume and complexity of devices uh, is, is exploding uh, from the point of view of health systems, uh, manufacturers, as well as uh, payers and providers. A lot of great innovation there, uh, including uh, increasingly connectivity, software enablement, and in some cases, uh, introduction of algorithms, uh, which has increased the um, importance of addressing any cybersecurity vulnerabilities and interestingly quite a number of the recalls uh, in terms of volume and percentage uh, that have been announced in the last two or three years large proportions of them are related to uh, software vulnerabilities um, that uh, might be exploited by bad actors and certainly to compromise a person identifiable information but also the clinical resilience if you will the operational resilience of, of devices that are central uh, to care and interventions. We're seeing the impact uh, more broadly of adverse events in terms of uh, unnecessary injuries, complications, and deaths. 
McKinsey's done a study that suggests uh, as much as seven to nine percent of revenues are lost by manufacturers uh, to fines, penalties, litigation, loss of top line revenues competitively, as well as reputational damage. The original study done in 2011 was recently updated uh, into 2017. So the numbers are in excess of $30 billion annually in an industry that's growing in the high single digits globally. And then from a health system standpoint, um, certainly to the extent devices are, are not available for use in routine care here, I'm thinking infusion pumps, ventilators, um, and uh, surgical instruments. Um, you've got uh, some challenges around managing uh, clinical outcomes, but uh, to the extent there actually are adverse events or recalls, uh, you need that transparency and visibility um, to, uh, to manage in a very uh, challenging budget setting, uh, one where unreimbursed costs, particularly in value-based care, um, are going to figure large when margins are a problem. Certainly putting patients at the center of poor patient experiences to the extent that you have complications or, or issues and clinician frustration. Um, so all the parties uh, involved uh, need to be concerned. I'd like to put an exclamation point on the, the uh, connectivity uh, element of this. Uh, devices are increasingly connected, interoperable with other devices and or systems like pharmacy systems and EHRs. I've mentioned the, uh, the algorithmic enablement, so introduction of AI and ML. The Mayo Clinic's Chief Information Security Officer shared at a regulatory workshop uh, some two years ago, uh, the FDA conducted, that he has across the three major facilities uh, uh, that Mayo maintains over 100,000 uh, assets, if you will, of which uh, 25,000 are connected. Uh, those connected devices are, comprise 6,000 unique makes, models, and versions, and over a dozen. Models. So from his point of view, every device is a snowflake. To have the visibility and maintain a cadence and rhythm around routine uh, upgrades, uh, maintenance and repair activity, understanding uh, how the software and co connectivity plays with the device function uh, and performance, all of these have put a tremendous burden on um, information security teams to work with the clinical operations, clinical engineering teams, network management, uh, as well as third parties um, to ensure that uh, the devices are, are up to date and patched. So I've, I've alluded to these four major areas of, of problems, yes, volumes and complexity. Uh, regulators uh, here in the United States, the FDA started an initiative about a decade ago um, across the life cycle to um, uh, have manufacturers assign unique device identifiers to improve traceability in the supply chain and in post-market settings. Uh, that regulatory uh, change has been largely implemented in the United States and now adopted in the EU. Likewise, uh, regulators are converging on uh, improved post-market surveillance and adverse event management by device manufacturers and in the EU uh, requirements around distributors to perform that activity. And clearly there's greater emphasis on real world evidence to support um, the clinical uh, utility as well as safety and effectiveness to, uh, of devices, uh, whether from a pre-market uh, 510K standpoint or in a post-market setting. Uh, and transparency is a problem because of the number of players that are involved over the life cycle of the device. Many of these devices, whether they are uh, an implantable defibrillator, um, uh, glucose monitor, or more mundanely, a best bed uh, or hoist um, uh, dialysis equipment, um, involve a number of parties. And here's where you start to say to yourself, um, do I know and understand across the uh, the life cycle and service history of a device, whether it's safe and in good order. Uh, our journey over the last three and a half years has taken us to focus on the health system as being at the center of this ecosystem that I've depicted here. Yes, in a supply chain sense, to the extent there are issues uh, that are recognized, manufacturers want to be able to traverse uh, their supply chain, both upstream to their contract uh, suppliers uh, their own work in terms of design production uh, and then ultimately distribution. But once uh, in use, if you will, um, at the point of care, uh, you typically have uh, some combination of um, clinical engineers that are employed by the health system 
manufacturers representatives and or uh, remote uh, servicing that are occurring and third parties, third parties that may be certified and contracted directly by the health system or third parties that are representing the manufacturer. Um, they all are involved in playing in the uh, service uh, maintenance and repair and uh, actioning of, of recalls on medical devices. Uh, you dig more deeply and you find out, particularly in those, those areas uh, like uh, surgery operating theater uh, and endoscopy units around diagnostics, that surgical instruments and, uh, and, and uh, endoscopes are uh, often uh, in the context of outsourced sterile services. They are moving off site. The third parties are coming in to perform decontamination and sterile services. Uh, devices in trial will involve CROs and often third party labs. Um, as you move to service delivery models, um, de emphasizing acute care and putting uh, your front foot on preventive management and self management. You'll either have people uh, uh, working with home care specialists uh, and the associated uh, devices and equipment and applications there, and often clinics or outpatient facilities. Uh, devices uh, are subject to routine audit and inspection. Ultimately, they may be decommissioned uh, and disposed of or uh, submitted to auction. Um, and those auction houses, which are, are growing in size, will go in often and buy up inventory uh, hospitals that are uh, either in opening new facilities or shutting down and make available online and in person a uh, full gamut of devices and equipment. Uh, there are limited warranties and representations as to the condition of the devices and equipment. Uh, and uh, this concept of having a service history uh, is germane. So this is the answer to, to why distributed ledger blockchain in this case. Um, if you look at uh, what uh, health systems are confronted with, um, they are well served by point solutions, but they do create silos. So what I've done here is, is break down um, examples uh, in various areas. So service management uh, capabilities supported by what are known as CMMS systems, computerized maintenance management systems or asset management systems, uh, the use of UDI tracking, cybersecurity management systems, recall management systems. I've referenced sterile, uh, sterile services and reprocessing services, um, integrations into the, uh, the cash like, cash to ca case to cash life cycle, ERP, HR, supply chain management systems, risk and compliance reporting. Uh, if, the, if the slide was wider, I probably could add some more. Um, and certainly to the extent manufacturers are introducing uh, service models uh, that support remote servicing, um, they are reinforcing um, the silo and the fragmentation uh, at the same time as they are um, helping uh, with response times and potentially uh, uptime for, for uh, health systems. It is nonetheless, from the standpoint of seeing across the device's service history, a challenge to bring together the, the data uh, across those silos. What we've done is, is uh, built on blockchain. I do not want to say that we are a distributed ledger blockchain company, rather that we have uh, taken advantage of the enabling technology and brought it together with uh, a leveraging of unique device identifiers, any kind of uh, coding and or tracking technologies such as RFID, RTLS, barcode systems, and then the appropriate scanning uh, in a facility, API integrations to ERP, EHR claims, and, and other systems. We have as well taken advantage of geospatial services and, and analytics um, to deliver the uh, timely actionable insights. I've represented here this concept of an operating life cycle, and you can see as I've talked about the various stages that you go through uh, with a medical device or equipment over the life cycle. Uh, stepping back from that, um, we are pleased to say that we have consistently focused on uh, data standards and the use of identifiers. GS1's done an extraordinary job with this. Uh, anyone who is uh, working in the medical device or uh, pharma area, consumables or otherwise will recognize that the work that GS1 has done there. They do have a healthcare working group uh, and certainly on their innovation side are, are looking at distributed ledger technology as well as uh, AI, IoT and other technologies. 
Uh, we work as part of the startup program with Esri. Uh, it's ArcGIS, geospatial data analytics and dashboarding uh, is, is quite robust and can accommodate um, extension of our strategic roadmap and product suite over time. And we have been working with Microsoft uh, as part of their, their program as well. Um, as regards the distributed ledger side of things, we started on Ethereum and certainly can maintain that, uh, that protocol uh, reference, uh, but we migrated to Hyperledger Fabric uh, some months ago. We have been in continuous discussions uh, around Sawtooth as well. Uh, likewise, giving consideration to R3's Corda. Um, our philosophy is to try to maintain flexibility and not uh, have vendor lock-in generally as a matter of principle. And certainly with regards to blockchain, we know and understand that there are uh, some growing pains and maturity issues. Uh, so we're looking to both capitalize on uh, the value of uh, community uh, and focus uh, such as Linux offers with, with Hyperledger, but also be protocol agnostic so that uh, we can both future-proof uh, the solution uh, and the services we deliver, but also provide that flexibility. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, in some of the some of the later slides. But let me catch a breath here and, and ask if there are any questions. I just have one question for you. Is it for reusable uh, devices or is it for all devices independent of, you know, their life cycle? begins the life cycle as well as uh, the reusable ones as well. Uh, well, so manifestly, uh, you want to have a, a service history, if you will, um, that would contemplate reusable. Now, reusable, remanufacture, reprocess, there are, you know, a lot of conversations and, and, and regulatory fine points around, around that, but single use as well as uh, what you'll call reusable um, would be included, absolutely. Some of these uh, devices, let me take an infusion pump by way of example, um, so commonplace, uh, typically in the hundreds in a, in a two or 300 bed hospital, uh, complex in the sense that it's everything from the, the gurney, if you will, that it's, that it's on, um, to the power supply, uh, the software, the syringe sets, um, the electronics uh, and mechanics of the, uh, the inner workings, um, fusion pumps have unfortunately got a lot of cranky issues as well as recalls um, and the urgency of, of being able to both have efficiency and get those to the beds and ensure that they're safe and good order is, is, is central to uh, the efficiency um, and the ability to get people in and out of beds, if you will. Um, unfortunately, um, with the advance of technology, um, it becomes a real problem uh, over time. Those service histories typically will extend as far as 10 years. Health systems that are challenged will, not just for infusion pumps, but other devices look to extend life. Warranty issues is certainly will um, play into that, but end of life management is also a picture um, that sometimes is, is difficult to sort through, uh, particularly without the transparency we're able to provide. Thank you. Yeah, hi Bob, this is Kamlesh. Hi there. Yeah, hi. Uh, is this solution uh, live in production? And uh, what is the uh, volume and uh, how many channels in, channels in the fabric? Sure. Um, some of our history, we, um, two and a half years or so ago, uh, were in discussions with Scotland's Inward Development Marm, Scottish, Scottish Development International, about our solution and not only were awarded a grant um, to set up a development center in Edinburgh, Scotland, which we did do. Uh, as part of the discussions, we were introduced to the National Health Service in Scotland, specifically National Services Scotland, uh, and decided that it made sense uh, for our, my co-founder and I to move over to Scotland uh, so that we might work more closely with some of the boards over there. We also received uh, and were party to uh, another grant that brought together National Services Scotland and uh, a leading cybersecurity researcher who is uh, well known in the distributed ledger blockchain community um, to work with us on a pilot uh, that extended about 18 months with National Services Scotland, uh, a three-way uh, partnership with, if you will, uh, to build out um, uh, 
a pilot uh, of the technology and uh, address what, what issues uh, they saw. What's interesting for us is uh, these were common issues and common challenges. We were able to demonstrate enough there that uh, we continue our discussions about how we might um, assist Scotland in uh, deploying a uh, solution that goes across its 14 regional boards that embraces and uh, is able to uh, support what they call digital health and social care, so the acute to outpatient to home-based settings. Uh, and we've been able to bring that back to the United States as well as uh, have interest in Canada with leading health systems about how we might bring together that ecosystem I'm talking about and uh, a minimum viable consortium uh, involving manufacturers and third-party service providers as well as other health systems. Okay, thank you. Hi, Susan, this is Nisarg. I'm actually a uh, connected health entrepreneur and very, very interesting topic. So thank you for this. I had a uh, few questions specifically related to, um, you know, telehealth and maybe connected devices. So uh, firstly, uh, you know, just to clarify is, are these deployments of yours within a clinical or provider environment or do they extend to maybe um, devices which might be involved in a telehealth? Um, you know, uh, use case, for example. And secondly, do yeah. what what uh, did did you encounter any specific, or could you elaborate a, a little bit more on your specific challenges with respect to connected devices? Uh, given that you know, obviously, there's APIs, data, and many other components to that, which could involve uh, various service providers. Sure. Um, on the first point, um, decidedly. Uh, our strategy and uh, sensible strategies, whether it's uh, what we saw in Scotland or by health systems here, is to focus on home care, uh, you know, not only uh, preventive, uh, but uh, self-management of care, as well as involving uh, home care specialists, what are known as social care specialists in Scotland. And if you will, the array of medical devices and equipment, as well as applications, call them apps, you know, sensors, whatever it is, uh, in a home setting. So let's talk about that geriatric patient that may have had uh, several falls. Um, you know, they may be related to neurological issues or otherwise. There may be a frailty app or something that does a detection of changes in gait um, that uh, is deployed as well as um, a bariatric bed or a home dialysis machine, those kinds of things. Uh, if we consider that array as well as environmental sensors, we know and understand um, that from a test bed setting, you wanna be able to know and be able to track what's there, uh, who's provided service, whether it's directly um, at the location or through remote uh, patches or upgrades, whatever it would be. So you've put your finger on a very challenging area, but an important one, whether it's in the home setting or an acute care setting. One of the areas that we're working on is the development of, uh, for lack of a better term, a model profile. So back to your, your second question about connected devices, uh, whether it's uh, attributes related to the network connectivity, um, firmware, um, AI, ML algorithms that might sit on a device um, from a clinical standpoint, whether or not uh, it's interoperable, what it's interoperable with, uh, what it's integrated to. Um, this model profile is increasingly pertinent to the extent that uh, vulnerabilities, exploitable uh, vulnerabilities and or cyber threats are identified and being able to canvas your inventory, if you will, match it against uh, those threats go through some kind of risk analysis and assessment from a clinical and technical standpoint, and then uh, make decisions uh, as to prioritization. Now, uh, that might be the information security team working with the clinical engineering team uh, at a hospital. Oftentimes it's going to involve third parties. Uh, I had the same experience when I was in financial services. Uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of applications, some cloud-based, some um, on-premise, uh, lots of integrations. And we needed to have a working a list, not only of apps, uh, but also the associated vendors and be able to communicate with them to identify what, if any, uh, vulnerability they may have 
um, and whether or not they had a plan of action and to what extent we could share information as to regards to whether or not um, they were going to proceed with that patch and uh, to what, you know, when it would occur and then track that. That was a manual process, uh, email, always uh, needing to update the information and then really no means by which to confirm that action had been taken uh, without a lot of effort on our part. Um, you can compound that. Um, I mentioned the, 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 the uh, Mayo Clinic example. In fact, studies have shown anywhere from 15 to 20% of uh, the assets in a, in a health facility, uh, call that device or equipment, is now connected um, and those numbers are rising and they're rising significantly. Uh, there are now smart beds that are, uh, through sensors, uh, able to develop uh, information about vital signs and, and other um, attributes um, that are being rolled into, rolled into wards uh, as we speak. Okay, thank you. And if, if, uh, for any cloud implementations, uh, for example, you mentioned, mentioned the AI and, or machine learning algorithms, for example. Uh, you know, obviously it's more efficient to do some of this processing and analysis on the cloud. Uh, did, did, did you, just to kind of uh, drill a little further, have any, any uh, encounter, did you encounter that use case or uh, did you happen to have any challenges? Uh, um, I've certainly uh, focused heavily on that, that long pole, if you will, of where things are going. Um, for those who are, are close to dis, uh, distributed systems and AI and ML, you'll know that the, there's a number of mechanisms by which folks are trying to preserve privacy um, as well as perform the kind of work that uh, uh, would be done by AI and ML at the edge. Um, that could be a combination of uh, differential privacy, it could be secure multi-party uh, calculations, it could as well be federated learning. Um, distributed learning, which uh, Google's been working on. Um, any and all of those, I think we all are challenged, and, and I'll not represent that uh, we're far along with this, but we will all be challenged with being able to provide uh, transparency and interpretability about what is going on at the edge. I'm not convinced that distributed ledger blockchain uh, plays a role, but I'm interested to explore whether or not it might play a role in providing transparency um, around, uh, you know, not only what's been done, but the evolution. Uh, for those who've paid attention, the FDA about a month and a half ago, actually it's a little bit longer, issued its proposed framework for uh, AI and ML. Uh, it's looking for the concept of good machine learning practices and consistent with its approach as a regulator demonstration that there is a process uh, and there is transparency on part of the manufacturer in terms of the design, the design of the, the initial algorithm, the evidence behind it, as well as uh, uh, ability to track the adapt, adaptable uh, algorithm uh, over its life cycle, if you will. Um, so it's a very interesting question. It will be, I think, a core challenge and problem. Uh, our view has been Let's be pragmatic. Let's establish around perhaps something as mundane as an infusion pump, but really central to care, a physical asset that's fairly well understood, has a fair amount of moving parts as well as that connectivity, and over time um, step into um, the models that are, are emerging, as we've discussed here, whether it's home care or um, AI, ML in the cloud. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Any other questions? Uh, I, I do have another slide I wanted to really have be a subject of discussion. Uh, okay. So this is uh, something I came up with uh, a few months ago. It was really my effort to articulate for um, uh, health systems manufacturers and others who um, are interested in blockchain, may not fully understand it, may conflate blockchain with a lot of other things. But to talk about the, the potential evolution uh, from minimum viable consortium um, to um, a, a robust production implementation. And what I've done here is uh, create two axes, one of which is uh, moving from a pilot environment uh, to a path to production. And then concepts like changing your operating model and only uh, a transformation of business models 
very deliberately using ellipses here rather than concentric circles because uh, just to take a use case, of, for example, with us, you might go from implant tracking initially to broader medical device management, as I've alluded to it, uh, ultimately uh, in acute care setting at our home. And then over time, in terms of actually delivering value, uh, be able to track and trace uh, to manage demonstrably safety and outcomes to improve those to actually getting into preventive care and even predictive analytics. Um, I don't believe that uh, as we establish minimum viable consortia, build out networks and actually have those networks uh, organically evolve, we'll be able to knock these things off uh, systematically. I believe it will be iterative. And what I've tried to do is represent here, um, sort of as you step out across time, um, the areas that uh, you're likely to want to focus on and be able to focus on, but as you add parties and complexity, you move from um, initial decisions, for example, about governance models to a better idea about commercial terms. Similarly, as you step out over time uh, and start to introduce those other parties, a better understanding from an operating standpoint, what you need to be able to support technically as well as internal to the various organizations that are participating how their workflows are gonna change, what it means for their legacy systems and integrations, and then step out over time to really start to address issues around performance, network operations, who's doing those operations, what do the economics look like, back to the commercial terms, and ultimately to scale. Um, I found this helpful for discussions and, and I'm interested in any reactions to it. Too much to absorb? <laughs> it's, it's early in the morning, I think. There you go. There you go. Well, uh, my contribution back to the general community, I know um, we all spend a lot of time um, deep around the technical issues. Um, there are challenges in having those conversations, whether it's with clinical people or uh, uh, senior technology executives or, or business executives, if you will, on the clinical side. Um, I found this helpful and uh, if you're interested in talking about it more or um, interested in using it, let me know. And, you know, as long as there's a, a source and an attribution, um, it's my contribution back to the community. Any other questions? This is, and I was just uh, curious. This is quite, you know, quite an it's it's great roadmap or evolution path. Uh, also, I feel quite ambitious as well. Uh, what do you anticipate to be a, you know, I guess a timeline for maybe getting to the second phase of this? Uh, because I'm assuming, you, you, I, I guess you've already been in operation for three and a half years, and what were you able to tackle in the last three and a half years, and what what do you think is uh, is going to happen in the next couple? Good question. I think we've been able to demonstrate um, that there's more than a foothold, that the, you are delivering value. Uh, pulling together a consortium uh, is something that's in process right now. Uh, from there, we have some working assumptions about consensus mechanisms, and, and certainly the concept of pluggable consensus makes sense. We're keeping an eye, idea, an eye on interoperability, certainly. Um, but if I look and step out, um, I'm thinking we've still got another two to three years um, before we either are um, adding meaningful uh, numbers of parties uh, to a consortium and exploring those areas uh, that I've suggested here in this part of the arc uh, to going broadly uh, to, and ambitiously to a wide range of devices. Now you'll, you'll prioritize those based on a variety of things uh, and your network will evolve. It'll either be more health systems, more manufacturers, more product lines, uh, more geographic expanse and, and some combination thereof. Um, so this is uh, not surprisingly a, a long journey. Um, we'll be probably pulled in one direction or the other, uh, but I would suggest that uh, even some of the established uh, consortia, uh, I'm thinking of provider credentialing uh, or provider directory and, and physician credentialing, um, they're a couple of years in now and they're at that point where they're looking to add players and, and uh, 
refine their commercial terms and extend uh, the performance uh, characteristics and also open to changes in, in the thinking from a technology standpoint um, around the value around different consensus mechanisms, security and so forth. So it is iterative. Um, I don't think we're unique in that sense. And that's one of the reasons um, I, I wanted to share this. You could take those three main dots on the, uh, uh, the diagonal axis and take uh, uh, other use cases, say clinical trials, and step them out. And I don't think you come up with a, 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 lot, a lot different in terms of uh, exploring these relationships and hammering these things out from a maturity standpoint. Time scales may differ, um, and that's why I offer it up. Okay, thank I you. I have another question um, uh, regarding, I was looking at the dot preventive care. It is, uh, you um, positioned it uh, over there, which is very much in the future, right? Yes. Um, and why is that so? I mean, I, I would also put it there, but I would like you to explain why. Why is preventive care not, um, you know, more uh, urgent? Or, um, that's a great question. I'm, uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, while distributed ledger is um, an element of that, uh, that to be ambitious uh, around being able to predict and clearly you're implying uh, the use of uh, demonstrated uh, real world evidence um, around the devices that have been introduced uh, that will fit into what we all now understand is a an array of inputs and information that's pertinent to preventive care. Um, so whether social determinants of health, things we may understand uh, that are more in the precision medicine area that allow you to go and stratify uh, populations and tailor that care to an individual. Uh, that's the long pull. At some level, I'm suggesting that, that there's an intersection between the evolution of distributed ledger technology and what it will enable in terms of traceability and verifiability around physical and digital assets uh, and other uh, major initiatives uh, in healthcare and medicine. Does that? Uh, yes, thank you. That, that is uh, along the same. I'm, no, no, no. I'm thinking uh, along the same way. And I would have, as I said, I would have posted it, added it there too. Um, I just uh, wanted to hear what, what you have to say. I agree with, I agree with what you said. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a, I appreciate that. I'm a little guarded because sometimes uh, I'll hear folks suggest that blockchain is the thing that's that's doing the predictive analytics at the edge or something like that. And I, I think I alluded that to to that before. Uh, it is an enabling technology that will support other technologies as well as insights we have. Um, that are converging around getting to that aspirational preventive care. And from the standpoint of our use case, uh, being able to deliver in a home-based setting is part of that. Any other questions? I have another question. Um, yes. I hope you didn't uh, um, uh, talk about it before. I had like some technical difficulties, so for 10 minutes I had to turn this off. I don't know if you <clears throat> discussed, you, you mentioned that you um, started with Ethereum and then uh, are now looking to Sawtooth or, or Fabric or you have solutions for both. Um, I don't know if you already talked about that, but can you so describe your experience with trying two different um, Hyperledger platforms, uh, why are you doing both at the same time and okay. what have you learned from it? Good question. Um, I, I wasn't clear on in what I said. So we started on Ethereum, we migrated to Hyperledger Fabric. Um, uh, we're an API enabled platform. We've had conversations and, and gotten under the covers around Sawtooth. We haven't uh, moved to Sawtooth. I think what's important, and it comes back to what we were just talking about, the Sawtooth, as originally intended by uh, Intel, uh, really uh, particularly uh, contemplated a world of, of uh, IOMT, an Internet of Medical Things, at least from a healthcare standpoint, but an Internet of Things, and volumes of sensors and devices in, in the tens of millions, if not billions. Um, it's SGX uh, chip that was, uh, you know, to sit underneath it as well. 
uh, to provide for that uh, secure, secure enclave. So from my standpoint, uh, it's important for us to know and understand and, and stay up to date um, with where Sawtooth is going. We're, we're pleased that it's within the Hyperledger Linux uh, rubric because that allows us to, to have that visibility um, around what's going on. But if you think about a, a 5G world, uh, with as many as 10 to 15 percent of uh, sensors and devices out there that are on networks, arguably uh, healthcare related, um, you have to uh, start to think about whether or not you'd have the scale. And, and at least from this standpoint, we felt it important to be aware of what's going on with Sawtooth. Does that answer your question? Yes, um, well, partially. So you, you, you did, um, <clears throat> you did not develop a solution for Sawtooth. You just um, uh, oh, where's my phone here. Okay, um, you, your solution is now you're using Fabric, right? That's correct, and we are um, under understanding underneath the covers where Sawtooth is going. They're they're uh, they're a little behind in some areas, but we continue to monitor that. And we monitor it with an eye to um, what I'll call a machine-to-machine -machine world and understand that to the extent we're working with medical devices uh, and, and apps, that we are going to be in that machine-to-machine -machine world in a meaningful time horizon. Okay, thank you. Susan, got one last question, uh, maybe a little bit more strategic. So you mentioned that uh, you moved to Scotland uh, because I guess from what I captured is that you were getting a lot more support for your um, for your idea and also your business model there. Could you kind of just speak a little bit about the receptive, how receptive um, providers or um, you, know, you know customers are in the U.S. versus other markets that you might be exploring? Right. Well, I'm back here on the East Coast because of the receptivity. Um, everyone's gone through a journey um, around. Uh, Distributed ledger and blockchain, those who've been around it in healthcare for some time know that uh, some of the initial focus and hype was around patient data uh, and uh, medical records on, on blockchains. Um, we've always been a little bit um, skeptical about the timelines around that. Um, so we took that time uh, to really prove things out and uh, we find a, there is growing interest from health systems and what we're doing as well as uh, device manufacturers. So. Um, the education that others have been doing has been very important. Some of the visibility the FDA has provided, as well as uh, various associations, and certainly the, this Hyperledger SIG group has really laid the groundwork uh, for us. That said, I think we can all appreciate that when you go into meetings uh, with executives, there's still uneven understanding and still um, some, uh, some need to address uh, cryptocurrency and, and broader uh, open. Uh, decentralization, what that means, what permissioned and perm permissionless mean. Uh, that's education that will continue to go on. I experienced it in finance, and I think it's a welcome opportunity to always revisit our assumptions. Great, thank you. Okay. Rich, can I hand it back to you? Absolutely. Uh, and, and again, thank you so much uh, for uh, pr presenting today. A phenomenal uh, presentation. I think it uh, really gives us uh, a lot of interesting thoughts around how, uh, how your team, particularly at Spiritus, have uh, taken advantage of uh, some of the technologies out there uh, that exist, uh, particularly including blockchain. And I think what I, what, I, what I really enjoy hearing about is the notion that uh, a blockchain solution, and in your case, DLT, isn't uh, isn't the end-all be-all. I mean, it, it's an aspect of uh, the work that you guys are doing, but it isn't necessarily uh, the panacea that a lot of people have been talking about as it relates to blockchain technologies. Uh, and in fact, it's it's really, uh, it's in support of the work that's being done uh, th through Spiritus. And so, uh, the, you know, the great takeaway there, uh, for me anyway, uh, is that, you uh, you know, you look really at uh, a handful of different technologies to support uh, the work moving forward. Um, just real quickly, I, I have a kind of a high level question uh, that I wanted to ask uh, before, before we sort of end, and that really is uh, stepping back a bit and, and looking at medical devices uh, in total, 
do, do you see a trend or a pattern uh, towards a standardization of, uh, of software APIs or software backends uh, that uh, ultimately make it easier for the management uh, uh, and life cycle uh, management of devices, or is that something that's still quite a far, quite quite far down the road? Um, a good question. Um, we all like standards, and the problem is that everyone wants their own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My uh, co-founder Bob Clint has been active uh, in two IEEE related initiatives around what I'll call IOMT, a pre pre standards group, and now a, a standards group. Um, I'm, I'm involved as well. We're, we're just breaking into subgroups. There has been participation from medical device manufacturers. They're active as well over on the, uh, the GS1 side, trying to arrive at some standards as well that tie back to the unique device identifiers and so on. But when you, you get into the nuts and bolts of the technology, I'm not sure that anyone's going to go to that level around uh, uh, the APIs at this point. Um, the, the flip side of that is if you look at some of the um, job postings among the major manufacturers around data science, AI, and machine learning, uh, they're moving aggressively and at pace because there's such promise and opportunity. Um, so it's a bit of a chase, and it will be for some time. Um, I don't like to, to, um, to over forecast uh, how quickly we might get to some things, but uh, I think the, the major manufacturers uh, know and understand that prioritizing um, strong software development lifecycle practices uh, with an eye to uh, security uh, as well as performance is going to be really important as they extend their business models and the delivery of these kind of interventions. Okay, it looks like uh, I'm the only one that's not muted right now. <laughs> 